Okay. So coming back to our discussion earlier about value-based compensation, you, you've actually written a couple of articles about some of the efforts that you guys are, are attempting to do here. In your article, Paying for Value, What's Next, uh, you say that the challenge now is about how to transform our system to one that rewards value. And, uh, so how are, you, how are you going about this process of shifting towards one that rewards value? Yeah, so, um, you know, again, we, we had a, a um, experiment with capitation in the 90s, and, and a lot of people feel that did not end well. And so what I think was learned at that point is giving docs a set amount of money and saying, del you know, deliver the most cost-effective care possible which then is now going to be the cheapest care possible, is, is not really a good means for long-term success. And so what's changed is that everybody gets that and we realize we need to, to, to talk about outcomes. We talk less about cost and more about value. What, it, what are the outcomes you're getting for, for that cost? So if you, you can think about it, quality over cost, if you would. So we're really trying to, to agree first on the outcomes and then what does it take to get there and coming up with fair payment that incentivizes physicians to think about what the right things are to do and not to think about what the things that, that get them paid the most. So for example, if you can manage a population and keep them out of the ER, and um, that, let's say a diabetic, and keep them out of the, the hospital, out of the ICU with the diabetic acidosis, that's a good thing, obviously. Uh, yet, if there are things you can do, let's say telephonic or, or virtual visits that aren't compensated that you won't employ, that, that's a disconnect. So it's really trying to get away from you're doing what gets you a billable CPT code, which again, I don't need, and you could view that on an ethical framework, but there's also the real world framework is that they have their own salaries to pay and infrastructure. So you have to think about doing things that are sustainable long-term that are a win-win. So we've tried to come up with the right outcomes. So we're spending much more time on the right outcome models. We've got more sophisticated informatic systems to share data as we go. So it's not just here's some goals, but we'll meet with you regularly so you know how you're doing and provide you some portals and other informatic tools so you can manage the population better. It's having the population tools that we have that we can w embed into these models to support the providers, whether complex case management or other types of programs. And, but it's also being flexible. And one of the big ideas is that one size doesn't fit all. And, and so another learning is if you tell docs either we'll capitate you or, or else not at all and you'll be disadvantaged, that may not be the right thing to do to force docs to take risk they're not ready for. And so what we've tried to do is come up with a more graduated approach and the idea that we want to pay everyone for value, uh, but we realize that you may have a different level of sophistication or a different level of um, comfort than, than another group. So no matter what your level of population health sophistication or your ability to manage risk or your willingness to manage risk, um, we want something on the menu for you. So for example, we have at a population level, we have maybe 10% of our members who are fully capitated by groups that are very good at, at doing that. And again, we, we're very clear on what the equality measures are so that we're not paying, it's not the goal isn't, you don't want the lowest cost provider, I don't want that for my family, you want the highest value. So it's designed to, to, to support that. But we also have a large number of, of our providers, um, the majority certainly in Eastern Massachusetts for at least a portion of their population who are in one of these models other than fee for service. So for example, if you're not ready for full risk, maybe you're in a shared savings or shared risk model. So a shared savings model looks at the overall cost of care for your patients who are attributed to you, whether it's money paid to you as a doc or spent on imaging or you know, or ERs or drugs or things that didn't go in your pocket. And it looks at the year over year trend for that population versus a broader population. And if your population does better, you get some of that savings. And in a shared risk model, you get some of that savings, even more of that share. But if it goes in the other direction, you may have to pay something back. Okay. So we're providing a pathway to acquire com um, comfort and to work at different levels of risk with the idea of being paid for outcomes. We don't want you to say, I'm not ready for full capitation, can't work with you. And the other area where we've been very innovative, you want to think of the other axis, is these are great if you're comfortable managing a population, if you're configured to manage a population. What if you're a really good oncology group? What if you're good at orthopedic surgery, diabetes? Those models don't really help you. 
Right. So uh, we've so we've because those models are primarily primary care. Well, they're population based population they're for based, all right. aspects. So okay. if you're a large system like a Leahy, a Beth Israel, okay. Deaconess, okay. Um, Atrius, et cetera, those th okay. those can work well for yeah. you. But if yeah. you're New England Baptist and your expertise is orthopedics, oh, I see. I see what you, mean. you don't uh, kind of own the patient, but you can't influence a lot of that. Right. So what we've done is try to look at, th at what's on the menu for those groups, kind of on another axis, if you would. So we've, you know, we've done a lot with medical homes for primary care. We sat down with an oncology group and we said, let's figure out a model that works for you. Let's look at the medical home model, white out the things that don't make sense, and let's talk together. We're not bringing this to you, do it or else. Let's talk about the things you can do that can impact care, that can improve quality, reduce inappropriate care, whether it's unneeded ER or end of life care that isn't appropriate, et cetera. What are things you can do, but which you're not doing today in part because you're not paid for, or they're not part of the expectations. And let's build up that model where let's agree on those are the expectations and the outcomes and uh, we'll pay you differently in a way. We'll pay you base fee for service, but an additional care coordination fee that reflects that savings. And we're doing that with a large series of practices, Commonwealth Hematology Oncology, which recently got acquired by Dana-Farr, but, but, but they're still maintaining them as community practices and we're working with them and that's gotten a lot of attention, has been successful. Um, we're doing bundle payments for procedures, whether it's for cabbages or even for colonoscopies, the idea that if we agree on uh, on a procedure and the right trigger in the right period of time and we pay you uh, in a way that's fixed, you're going to figure out what have you been doing that doesn't need to be done, whether it's around post-op care or rehab or unnecessary lab work and stop doing it. And, and we design these in a way that we and the provider practices share in that saving. So we look at what we think it'll cost and we share some of these data models transparently and we will show them, look, a lot of the patients here are going to ERs because they don't have post-op pain management. If you, have, if you think more about prescriptions and about providing access after hours, somebody can call on a script and we can eliminate those, think of the dollars that go into this. So we're, we're clear about what we think the drivers are. We also, we also want to make this a win-win. So this is not a one-off negotiation like buying a car. At the end of the year, we want everyone to say, this is great, let's continue it. Not you had smarted us because we didn't yeah. think about that. Because you are so, in a relationship with these people. Yeah, we want, it's, this is a lot of work. I mean, yeah. some of these take, can take six months to figure out the pieces before they go live. Mm -hmm. So we want them to work. We don't want someone to outsmart the other, say, well, God, we, you know, you, we didn't realize that this care was delivered and it's in the bundle or something that because of the information asymmetry. So um, we, we bend over backwards to be fair, to course correct if there's a new drug comes out uh, that should be part of a bundle, for example, and isn't priced in. And we agreed, for example, what about something catastrophic? You know, the docs haven't signed up for that. So we agreed with most of our bundles, if something happens, let's say with a cabbage, someone has a uh, you know, a stroke or something, which is very expensive. We, we actually statistically drew the line in two sigma out, two standard deviations away from the mean, and said above that point, it reverts to fee for service or out of the bundle, because it, it isn't fair to you to put you in that situation where a catastrophic event could wipe out the, you know, all of the good you've done with all of your other yeah. patients. So it's yeah. really about sitting down at the table, being fair and doing something that works for everyone versus a typical contract negotiation framework under fee for service of, we want to pay you less, you want us to pay you more. So again, this is you yeah. know, about how do we enlarge the pie through eliminating unnecessary costs. So that's, to me, a lot of the fun and, and, and very rewarding, and a lot of the docs are getting that. Yeah. Could you briefly describe what you mean by a bundle? Because yeah, I know there's, there was a t there's a time element to it. There's a, there's a number of things that kind of keep something in or out of the bundle. Yeah. So a, a bundle is... You know, and you know, in a sense, a DRG is kind of a bundle for the hospitalization component alone, just for the for the facility portion. We're trying to put this on steroids with with guarantees. So, a, a, an example would be a bundle. There's generally a trigger, and you can do this for chronic care. We're starting to play with diabetes procedures are are still complex, but they're simpler. So, let's say a total knee replacement. Okay. Or, you know, it could be treating stage three colon cancer, but let's say a total knee. So, we agree on a certain population. Let's say we'll have a different bundle for those with bad heart disease or some other or revisions, but let's agree on a certain consistent population. And once we agree that they need a total knee, uh, we'll pay you through the bundle. And what that means is that all care after that point, all the pre-op work, the hospitalization, the rehab, um, the additional physicians who see that patient, so if, a, in a, if a, an internal medicine does a pre-op consultation, that's included in the bundle. It's coming, we're gonna pay you this fixed amount whatever the dollar value is, you're going to divvy it up. Although, in, you know, in some models, you know, it's 
paid out and then recouped afterwards, which I don't think is effective managerially for influencing change, getting to the tragedy of the commons problem. Mm -hmm. Why should I be more efficient if he may not be in suck up all the excess? So we need an entity that actually is sophisticated, they can manage the pieces and the cash flows and manage the, the dollar payments to all the pieces of the delivery chain consistent with and commensurate with the value they're creating. But um, so it would include for procedure hospitalization, all of the physicians, you know, surgeon, anesthesiologist, um, the other physicians who may see them, post-op care, generally rehab, et cetera. And, and generally we try to go out to a certain point in time, ideally a year or two, sometimes based on the groups they may not want to go out that far. So if, it, if there's a year, for example, that means that any additional care during the time that's related to the total knee could be an ER visit, it could be a revision, it could be a hospitalization for infection or, or a revision to the implant, you don't get paid extra for doing that. So we build in a little into the bundle based upon a cost allocation for that, if you would. But if you believe that those are under, you know, that can be influenced by the physicians, which we think they can be, then it's fair to put that in there and to say this is now an opportunity for you to improve your margins by, by, being, uh, by thinking more about what you do and you don't do. And there's a lot of evidence uh, suggesting that those kind of models are very effective in driving care with the right partners. Again, we're starting to think about chronic disease as well, which is more complicated for reasons that are probably obvious. Mm -hmm. And beyond bundle, bundles, we're starting to think about outcomes-based payment for pharmaceuticals. So high-cost drugs are in the news lately, whether hepatitis C or the new PCSK9s for cholesterol. And each of those classes, for example, is is it's just, uh, they're, they're impacting our trend, our year-over-year -year increase in spend by over 1% each, just for, by one new class of drugs. Mm -hmm. and I just gave you two examples in the mm -hmm. past two years. So pharma companies are historically paid for pills, right? They don't know or care right. what happens once it, and, and we're telling more and more, no, you need to be paid for solutions. We're paying everybody else for outcomes you need to get with the program. Really fascinating. And again, the, you're getting a lot of here's why we can't do that, but we're starting to push pretty hard. That's when we're in the very early innings, and we're starting to talk about, okay, so you know, Barty, you say your, your new CHF drugs reduces hospitalization by 21%. And again, given there are data challenges and population identification issues, yes, but are you willing to pay us back some of our money if we don't see the hospitalization drop by that amount? Hey, it's your data. You know, we're not asking you to commit to something. That's what you said on that when you applied for the FDA labeling. So, right. um, and, and again, initially it's here's why we can't, and now we're starting to push them. And particularly where we, as we're, we as payers are being more selective, so more and more we're likely to say, yes, you can have this one hep C drug, but not the other. And we're likely to do that with, with other classes as well, where we see them both as being highly effective and equally safe. A lot of our, you know, a lot of our decisions relating to our formulary are likely to be around, are you willing to change the, the thought process to one where you're putting your money where your mouth is? Wow, what a fascinating idea. So it's, that's cutting edge and as part of the fun as well.